Hey everybody, Organized Biology here. You know it's gonna be a great lesson when I have all these colors to use. So today we're gonna to talk about blood pressure. We're gonna talk specifically about how your body raises your blood pressure, as well as a teensy bit about how it lowers your blood pressure. So let's get right into it. So I'm going to divide it into two main sections on how your body raises blood pressure. We're gonna talk about the sympathetic nervous system and its effects to raise it, as well as the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, the RAS system, to raise your blood pressure as well. And I'm going to tie it into remember from the last video, if you haven't watched it, it'll be linked right here or somewhere on top of my head at this point. And remember that arterial pressure, the average of your artery pressure is combined with three values, stroke volume, heart rate, and systemic vascular resistance. Okay. So therefore, if we're going to raise our blood pressure in our body, we have to elevate one of those three values or multiple values. Okay. And at the end, I'll talk about how your body can decrease it a little bit, but it's not very good at it. Let's start with the sympathetic nervous system. So if you remember from my previous video, on the nervous system, you know that the sympathetic nervous system deals with your fight or flight response. So this is going to prepare your body for action, right? And when we have this, we need to feed our cells our blood very quickly and efficiently. Okay, so remember the last video when I talked about how the blood needs to get to the cells to feed them? Well, now the cells are really, really demanding a lot of blood, so therefore we've got to raise blood pressure. So the sympathetic nervous system's gonna exist to raise blood pressure. So we are going to have some ganglia, which is literally just a group of neurons chilling out in what's called the sympathetic chain, right next to the brain and the spinal cord. And there will be neurons, sympathetic neurons, that will extend out to several different regions. Number one being the SA node of the heart, another one being to the arteries, the main muscular arteries and arterioles of your body, as well as down to your adrenal medulla. So let's start at the heart specifically. So when the sympathetic nervous system talks to the SA node, remember the SA node is the pacemaker of your heart. So it basically determines, hey, when are these muscles in the heart going to contract to make your heart beat, all right? And when the sympathetic nervous system talks to the SA node, it will stimulate it to depolarize, to get electrically charged faster and faster and faster, thus raising your heart rate. So remember over here, we've got one check for raising heart rate. The sympathetic nervous system will do that thus raising blood pressure. Okay, let's go to the arteries now. So when the sympathetic nervous system talks to the arteries themselves, it'll talk to the smooth muscle lining the arteries. And we know that when the sympathetic nervous system talks to smooth muscle, specifically in the arteries, the arteries will vasoconstrict. So that means they will get narrower. And if we get narrower, we're actually going to increase the resistance of the blood flowing into those arteries. So therefore, we're going to increase systemic vascular resistance by vasoconstriction. Great, but at the same time, and this is probably the main thing you need to remember, the nervous system, the sympathetic division, will talk to what's called the adrenal medulla. So here's your adrenal gland sitting on top of your kidneys, and when the sympathetic nervous system talks to the adrenal medulla, it will secrete very important hormones into the blood. Those hormones being epinephrine and norepinephrine. This is also called adrenaline and noradrenaline, depending on where you're at in the world. Now, these guys, I'm just going to designate as a little square. They're going to have very similar actions, so I'm going to treat them as the same thing, although they will have slightly different functions. So what will happen when you get in this fight or flight response? These guys will go through the bloodstream, which means it will go everywhere, one of my core concepts of anatomy and physiology. So therefore, if it's going everywhere, it's going to go to these specific structures that I've talked about, right? Number one, it will go to the arteries. When it goes to these arteries, it's going to bind to these little receptors on the smooth muscle of the arteries. These guys are called alpha receptors, specifically alpha-1 receptors. And when they bind to that epinephrine and norepinephrine, what will happen is, you probably guessed it, vasoconstriction will happen as well. So not only does the sympathetic nervous system directly talk to the arteries to constrict them, but the hormones released by the adrenal medulla will do the same thing, thus increasing systemic vascular resistance. Wonderful. But also, the epinephrine, norepinephrine, can go to the heart tissue itself. When it reaches the heart tissue, it's going to bind to what's called beta-1 receptors. And this is found specifically, as you can see, in the muscle layer of the heart, the myocardium. And when epinephrine and norepinephrine bind to these beta receptors, it will induce stronger contractions of the heart. This is due to the release of calcium ions into the heart muscle itself, thus making it contract more efficiently and strongly. So the way I remember these two and where they're at is because the alpha-1 receptors are located in the arteries and the beta-1 receptors are located in the beating heart. Awesome. So therefore, since the heart is contracting stronger, it's likely that the stroke volume will also increase. And last but not least, the sympathetic nervous system can also branch all the way over 
to the kidneys themselves and stimulate the secretion of what's called renin. And that's where we're going to pick up in the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So once again, the sympathetic nervous system can induce the secretion of renin from these kidneys, but renin can also be secreted by the kidneys themselves when the filtration pressure decreases. You see, the kidneys are very, very needy. They need a specific amount of fluid to be pushed through to be filtered every second in the plasma of the blood, right? So the blood is getting filtered in the kidneys, so it has to keep this constant filtration pressure. And if that drops, it's basically signaling the kidneys, hey, we've lost some blood or we've lost some blood volume, or therefore we've lost blood pressure. So the kidneys will initiate this whole system by releasing that renin. And this is when a lot of things have to occur in a cascade. So what will first be happening is the liver right here will be secreting what's called angiotensinogen into the bloodstream. If you break the word down, anytime you see ogen, it means two things usually. Number one is it's inactive. So it's not making an effect right now. And the second thing, it came from the liver. The liver likes to secrete inactive things and then they get activated by other things, which we'll see here in a second. Now look at the first part, angiotensin. Think about what that means. Well, angio means blood vessel. And tensin sounds like tension, right? So if you were to predict what angiotensin will eventually do, what do you think it's gonna do? probably tense up the blood vessels once again. It's going to cause systemic vascular vasoconstriction, so the constriction of a bunch of different vessels. So we're going to wait for that. It's not happening now because it's inactive. So what will happen is renin will be coursing through the bloodstream along with angiotensinogen. And when they come into contact, renin will actually go up to it and activate this molecule into what's now called angiotensin 1. But angiotensin 1 is very lazy and really doesn't do a whole lot. So it needs an extra kick in the butt by another structure. And that structure is going to be the lungs, which is going to be producing what's called angiotensin converting enzyme, also known as ACE. And if you read the words, it probably means that we're going to convert angiotensin to something else. And that's exactly what's going to happen. So when these two come into contact with each other, it's going to convert angiotensin 1 into the big guns angiotensin 2. And finally, we have something that is occurring. See, angiotensin 2 does a variety of different things to help increase our blood pressure. So let me go through a few of those. The first thing it does is it's going to go to a variety of different blood vessels and constrict them. So we call that systemic vascular vasoconstriction. So we're going to be squeezing a lot of these blood vessels, increasing, remember, that systemic vascular resistance. And what will actually also happen is more blood will return to the heart at a rapid rate, thus increasing preload, which we talked about in this video right here, if you want to check that out, thus increasing stroke volume. But it also induces the release of one other hormone. It's called aldosterone, right? So this guy is going to travel specifically to the adrenal cortex. So that's the outside of these adrenal glands, and the adrenal glands will then secrete what's called aldosterone. And once we make aldosterone, if you've learned from my endocrine system videos, aldosterone is going to go to the kidneys and help the kidneys reabsorb salt and water back into the bloodstream, thus increasing blood volume, thus increasing stroke volume. Wonderful. So remember, that's the second thing. It stimulates aldosterone release. And then finally, it also talks to the posterior pituitary gland and tells it to secrete what's called vasopressin. Vasopressin is also known as ADH or antidiuretic hormone, which means the kidneys will be told to hold on to more water, thus increasing blood volume, thus increasing stroke volume. Wonderful. And remember, if this is... If this video has raised your blood pressure up until this point, please click the like button because it's really nice to do, and also subscribe to the channel if this has been helpful to you. So why do you think the body is so good, as we can see, at raising your blood pressure? Well, it's because if your cells need blood and they need to be fed blood constantly, you need to be really good at getting the blood to them. Now, the problem is your body is very poor at actually lowering your blood pressure. In fact, I can count on two fingers how many ways your body can lower your blood pressure. Number one, is by parasympathetic impulses. You see, this whole time I've been talking about the sympathetic nervous system, which has existed to basically get your body ready for fight or flight. But when you are calm and resting, your parasympathetic nervous system takes over. And what it will do is it will originate in the brainstem and actually come and communicate to the SA node as well. And it will inhibit the SA node, thus lowering the heart rate. And not only that, if the parasympathetic nervous system is triggered due to relaxation, all of these other sympathetic stimuli will cease to function at that moment in time until they're needed later on. 
All right. So that's the biggest thing is parasympathetic impulses, as well as the secretion of a hormone called BNP. This is released from your heart whenever your heart is working really, really hard and it's getting over distended. In fact, it stands for natriatic peptide, which means salt protein. Okay, so what it does is it'll actually go to the kidneys and it will tell the kidneys, hey, we have too much blood in our system because I am getting overworked. Therefore, start excreting out more salt, thus excreting out more fluid, thus decreasing blood volume, thus decreasing stroke volume, thus decreasing blood pressure. So those are the two main ways your body can actually decrease your blood pressure naturally. So here's the problem. If we have all of these ways to increase our blood pressure, but very few ways to decrease it, that's why we need to have several different blood pressure medications because a lot of people suffer from what's called hypertension or high blood pressure. It's a chronic disease, very common in Americans, and it is very dangerous. So in order to treat it, we need to do something to this process to lower people's blood pressure. In order to learn about that, I would recommend you go to this video right now. So if you're gonna be a nurse, you already know what those blood pressure medications are and how they work. And don't worry, I'll give you some helpful hints on how to remember them in that video. We'll see you over there.